Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I apologise, I was supposed to be wearing my ITP t-shirt and forgot. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so this is the, the Princess Alexander Hospital in Brisbane where I work and Daniel regularly visits. It uh, doesn't look quite as impressive since all the cladding came off when it was found to be the same cladding that was uh, used for the Grenfell Tower in London. So it looks a bit sort of <laughs> a bit less shiny than that now, but blue skies in Brisbane today, I'm assured. So first of all, just a bit of a historical perspective. Um, uh, ITP wasn't really recognised as ITP uh, years ago, but certainly there were some descriptions of, of the um, of the what we now think was ITP. It was actually initially thought to be a disease of the skin before it was realised it was it was a disease that you know affected the whole body, and it was thought to affect people of a weak and delicate um, habit. Women and boys uh, appeared to be the most liable to it, and in the latter, boys nosebleeds appeared to be the most common. Uh, sort of manifestation. Um, those predisposed to it were said to be those who led a sedentary life, had pure diet, breathed in impure air, had anxiety of the mind, and these things were, the, were thought to be the sort of precipitating factors for ITP. You'll be pleased to know though that the treatment in those days is probably something most of us wouldn't be too averse to. A moderate exercise in the open air, a generous diet, and the free use of wine. <laughs> so um, if you choose to follow this advice, I just have to say the advice was several hundred years old and it may not be current advice. So we don't have a national uh, ITP registry in Australia, so our uh, data, sort of population data, largely comes from the U um, larger studies in the US and a registry in the UK. So chronic ITP incidence in the UK is around 3.3 per 100,000 per year. So in Australia, if we can use that same um, uh, information and sort of um, boil it down to our population, what that means is there will be approximately 825 new cases of ITP which have lasted more than one year um, every year. So the incidence, which means the number of new cases and the severity of ITP increases with age. So unlike the old descriptions, which suggest it's women and boys, in fact, what the, uh, the more recent data suggests is, is indeed younger women are, are, um, are predisposed to ITP and indeed many other autoimmune diseases. But in fact, it's older men who really are, the, I guess, the, the most common um, demographic that, that present with ITP. So the prevalence of ITP in the UK, that means the number of people living with ITP is around 0.02%, uh, which is 2 per 10,000, which means 1 in 5,000. So in Australia, with a population of around 25 million, we would say there should be around 5,000 people living with ITP in Australia. Now, it's important to remember that ITP can be diagnosed in someone with a platelet count of less than um, 100, where other causes of thrombocytopenia have not been identified. So in fact, around 40% of people with ITP will never require treatment. They'll have a low platelet count, but it's a safe platelet count to lead a pretty normal life. About a third of adults um, who uh, respond to first-line treatment of ITP, which is generally steroids uh, with or without some immunoglobulin, uh, respond to treatment and often don't need treatment thereafter. That doesn't mean to say, though, that their platelet count goes back to normal. What it means to say is they get a safe platelet count and, again, can lead a normal life without any more treatment. However, two-thirds of adult patients uh, who present with ITP, uh, irrespective of their response to initial treatment, will need ongoing treatment, whether it be for uh, continuous uh, low platelet count, um, platelet count that hasn't responded at all to initial treatment, or in many cases, an initial response followed by a relapse on coming down off steroids. So I mentioned earlier that, that there was a, there's a gender difference. So the blue bars are women, the red bars are men. So as you can see here, these are age groups under 18, 18, 24. I'm not sure if you can see those clearly, but older as you go across the screen. So younger women um, are, are so, so around twice as many women than men in the sort of 20s and 30s. And then as you get to the older population, a few more men than women uh, present with ITP. Now, ITP can be what's called primary. Now, primary ITP is where there's no other disorder 
uh, linked to the ITP uh, that may be driving the ITP. Uh, so generally speaking, when people present with ITP, a whole load of tests are done to see whether there's any evidence of underlying hepatitis, HIV, or other autoimmune conditions. Around 80% of patients, you find none of these, but in around 20%, you will find uh, another associated condition. Now, some of these are known pre-existing conditions, and some are discovered at the time people present with ITP. But it is important to look for these things, because certain of these conditions, uh, you find the ITP will not respond to standard ITP treatment unless you really address the underlying condition. So particularly things like hepatitis C, uh, HIV, um, really, you've got, to, you've got to treat the underlying condition if you want the ITP to respond in a sustained fashion. H. pylori, um, I'll just touch on that a bit later. That's a bug that lives in the stomach. You've got to, tr you know, if you treat that, sometimes you can get rid of ITP. Um, so there are a whole load of things here um, that, that can cause um, secondary ITP. Each of them is relatively uncommon in terms of the whole picture, but important to identify, as I said, because it does make a difference to treatment. So what causes ITP? Well, it's sort of been a long process of working out, really. So in, in 1916, splenectomy was found to be effective treatment for ITP. So clearly, we've sort of moved on from it being a skin disease to being a disease in the, you know, a systemic disease, a disease that affects the whole body. And then in the 1920s, it was first found that, that women with severe thrombocytopenia ITP, sometimes had babies who also had severe thrombocytopenia. So it's something that can cross the placenta from the mother to the baby. And then in the 1960s, one of the best experiments ever written up in the history of medicine occurred, the Harrington-Hollingsworth experiment. And I'll just briefly tell you about this. This is the sort of thing that we're not allowed to do anymore. So Harrington and Hollingsworth worked in the um, Barnes-Jewish Hospital in New York. Basically what they did is they took 500 mils of whole blood from a patient with severe ITP and then transfused it into themselves. And what happened, now what you'll find, if you're sharp-eyed, you'll see that at the time they didn't have the automatic blood counters that we have now that we put blood through that gives us a platelet count. In fact, at the time, as you can see, a normal platelet count, these are all normal people working in the lab, the baseline platelet count was sort of 600 to 800. That's kind of interesting because I'm sure most of you know that w what we regard as normal now is around 150 to 400. But irrespective of that, you can see all these lines sort of drop down quite dramatically and then came back up again around a week later. And the lead, the lead investigator had the worst fall in platelet count. So platelet count dropped from 800 um, over, over the period of a few hours down to an unrecordable platelet count and then recovered slowly over the next week. And in fact, uh, he developed a severe headache uh, which was thought likely to be a bleed into the brain. At the time, there was no CT scanning or other scanning, um, so I guess it was a presumptive diagnosis. But the management at the time was somehow being put on a tilt table. I'm not exactly sure what the, the thinking was behind that, but uh, fortunately made a complete recovery with no ongoing sort of stroke-like symptoms. So I guess what that showed, to, uh, to put that into context, is, is that it was a factor that was transmissible through blood from one person into another, causing temporary ITP into the recipient of the blood transfusion. So how is ITP diagnosed? Well, you, what, I'm not sure if most of you might have an idea about this, but, but most things in medicine, you know, if, if someone comes along and they have all the symptoms and signs of a disease, and they have a blood test that shows an antibody that you know that causes the disease, you say, well, oh, diagnosis made, easy. And, it, and it is, that, that's the case for most diseases like thyroid disease, lupus. It's usually generally straightforward. If you have the symptoms of the disease, have a blood test that shows the antibody, you've got the disease confirmed. But unfortunately, that's not the case in ITP. So um, I guess nearly all of us have, have found this. Um, I looked at this in, in a group of patients with um, thrombocytopenia in Brisbane in the 80s and found that um, about 30% of patients who didn't have ITP but had severe thrombocytopenia following chemotherapy or had aplastic anemia did have antibodies to their platelets. And on the other hand, a lot of people who did have a diagnosis of ITP had no detectable antibodies. So in ITP, I won't say it's a difficult diagnosis, but it, it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, which means you have to make sure it's not another disease causing low platelet counts. So you have to rule out other causes of low platelet counts. It's not a really simple kind of two-step diagnosis.
So, but the really important thing is that not everyone with low platelet count has ITP. And one of my favorite sort of aspects of being a doctor who, with interest in thrombocytopenia is actually undiagnosing people with ITP. Because you often get sent patients to someone with an interest in ITP. I often get referred patients who've had platelet count that hasn't responded to steroid treatment, intravenous immunoglobulin, splenectomy. Often patients have been on clinical trials of new investigational agents and haven't responded. And in fact, uh, a lot of them don't have ITP. Um, so there are certain things that might make you more suspicious that someone didn't have ITP. So if there's a family history, so certainly it's possible that people in different generations in a family could have immune thrombocytopenia, but, it's, but it certainly raises the possibility that it's another cause. So a family history of low platelets, deafness at an early age, or kidney failure without clear causes can be uh, an indicator that you are not dealing with ITP, you're dealing with a different condition, a hereditary low platelet count. Failure to respond to the usual treatment for ITP is again a flag that the diagnosis might be wrong. Um, if there's, these days people seem to have blood tests all the time for no particular reason, but certainly a few years ago that was less common. Um, so if you've got if you've got no record of a previous normal platelet count, again, that, that's, it's not a marker that it, this may not be ITP, but it's always much more reassuring that you are dealing with something like ITP if you know someone's had a, a previously normal platelet count recently and it's dropped. So the important thing is, though, if, if, there, is no, if there is a family history, if there's no response to ITP treatment, if there's no previous record of a normal platelet count, you could be dealing with a hereditary thrombocytopenia or what's called a familial thrombocytopathy. And the importance of making a diagnosis is these conditions don't respond to steroids. And as I'm sure most people with long-term ITP know, long-term steroid treatment is not a very good thing for your long-term health. So I think it's important to diagnose these things to avoid treatments that are used for ITP that are not useful in these conditions. So I've had a 35-year-old man who had 15 years of treatment for ITP, had uh, thinning of the bones such that he'd had a collapse of a couple of uh, bones in his back uh, due to long-term steroid exposure, who didn't have ITP. So I undiagnosed him, but there's nothing much I could do about uh, his skeleton. Um, I obviously did give him some treatment and referred him to a bone uh, expert who was able to treat him and try and improve his bone strength, but he'd already suffered from the long-term side effects of steroids when he had a disease that wouldn't have ever responded to steroids. The other thing about hereditary thrombocytopenia is, is some of them can cause an increased risk of leukemia. Most of them, it's not a huge increase. It's, a, it's the order of around 10% uh, risk, lifetime risk of leukemia, as opposed to uh, around uh, le well, less than half a percent in the general population. Uh, the important thing to remember, I will say, when in my patients I diagnose with these conditions, the most common of these conditions would be one uh, called RUNX1 or RUNX1. Uh, I, I get to put it in perspective, I tell uh, particularly ladies with this condition that the risk of breast cancer is still higher than the risk of leukemia. Um, but obviously you can do things about screening for breast cancer and you really can't do much about screening for RUNX1 in a sense that you can uh, give preventive treatment. But genetic testing is now available in Australia for these familial thrombocytopathies. So certainly if you've got the flags that people are not responding to routine treatment, that is something that people should be seeking. If you're told you, you, you've got ITP, it's not responded to anything, and you think, oh, my father had ITP, my sister's got low platelets, you know, just raise the point that you may not have ITP. Because sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't occur to your doctor. They get fixed on a diagnosis and just, you know... Um, just keep trying to treat it and it's never going to work. So until sort of about 1990s, um, you know, th we were stuck with a, a sort of a, a thoughts about ITP that have really been going for sort of, you know, probably 50 years. Over, over the past sort of 100 years, it's been realised it's really not a skin disease. It's something that does respond to removing the spleen, so it must be a circulating factor. It's a factor that could cross the placenta from the mother to baby. It's a factor that can be transmitted by others by transfusion of blood, resulting in temporary ITP, as was shown in the Harrington Hollingsworth experiment. But the treatment was all aimed at dampening down the immune system, so pr principally steroids or immunosuppression, um, and stopping platelets being trapped and removed in the spleen, such as splenectomy. So 
fortunately, we've now had a sort of revolution, really, in the way we've treated ITP that has really transformed the lives of a lot of people with uh, chronic ITP. So if we look at how platelets ma are made, that sort of helps in explaining, um, you know, how the newer treatments of ITP have come into play. So platelets are made in the bone marrow. The bone marrow is the factory for all blood cells. And megakaryocytes are the cells in the bone marrow that make platelets. They're called mega because they're big. They're by far the biggest cells in the bone marrow. And they're easily spotted when you do a bone marrow biopsy. Uh, I was going to put a picture in, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so and megakaryocytes, um, so they are controlled by a hormone made in the liver and also possibly the lungs uh, called thrombopoietin or TPO. And uh, the liver makes this hormone at a constant rate. And then this hormone is released and it binds to platelets and megakaryocytes. So if you have a high platelet count, more thrombopoietin or TPO gets bound to platelets. So less goes on to stimulate the megakaryocytes, so you make less platelets. So it balances out. So high platelet count, less platelets made. If you've got a low platelet count, there's less platelets to bind this hormone. More of it gets to the bone marrow. You get more stimulation of megakaryocytes, so more platelets are made. So what the body tries to do is keep a balance up through production, constant production of this hormone, but the way it's sort of bound by platelets determines how much gets into the marrow and how much platelet production occurs. So the aim is, if you like, to keep a constant normal platelet count. So the newer treatments um, which have come in in the last 15 years, um, rom romiplostim, which is called N-plate, or l trombopag which in Australia is called Revelade, these are drugs that do the same job as TPO. So they're not TPO, and in fact, um, uh, around 20 years ago, a drug that was, really was a, an absolute mimic of TPO was made, but unfortunately, um, because it caused production of neutralizing antibodies, that, so the body of the patients who were given this drug reacted to it. And then unfortunately, the, the, the antibody that was created reacting to the drug also reacted to the patient's own TPO that they were making. So a lot of these normal volunteers who were involved in the initial studies then had severe thrombocytopenia going on for more than a year. But these newer drugs, they're different <coughs> to the actual hormone that's produced in the liver. So they, you don't, if you like, your body doesn't reject them and, and create an antibody to them. So this is just a cartoon, really. I won't go through it again. But this is a cartoon illustrating what I just said about the production of a TPO in the liver binding to platelets, uh, unbound um, TPO going into the marrow and um, stimulating megakaryocytes. So that's really just for the, the slides, sort of explains things uh, that I've just gone through. So the really important observation that led to the production of uh, the, the, the thought that thrombopoietin might help in ITP is this is the platelet count here in blue. So normal platelet count, you know, 150 to 400. So this is, this is a normal population, platelet count average in the high 200s, pretty low level of thrombopoietin detected on the blood test for circulating thrombopoietin. In aplastic anemia, uh, which is a disorder of the bone marrow where very few red cells, white cells, all platelets are made, so you have a very thin marrow. Um, platelet count is very low, characteristically. But the level of thrombopoietin measured in the blood is really quite high in an effort to stimulate the megakaryocytes and make more um, platelets. However, in ITP, despite the low platelet count, the thrombopoietin level was nowhere near as high as you might expect for the low level of platelets. So that led to the thought that maybe if you could give a boost of thrombopoietin through uh, an artificial thrombopoietin, i.e. one of the drugs, you might be able to increase the production of platelets. And in fact, that's, that's what worked and that's what happened. And that's why we've got these fantastic new drugs that have allowed us to drop, in many cases, uh, steroids and other immunosuppressive drugs for the, from the recipe for treatment. So ITP is caused by increased platelet destruction, but also reduced production of platelets. So we have a balance here um, in ITP where uh, decreased platelet production, uh, increased platelet production can result in thrombocytopenia, and what we try to do is, is sort of even up the uh, seesaw back to a normal level. So what we do find, though, is, is ITP is a bit of a variable disorder, and experience suggests that there is a bit of a spread, you know. So most people are along the spectrum here. There's platelet underproduction, there's, there's destruction of platelets in the spleen. So most people, the vast majority of people, will respond just to one drug, 
Uh, so 80% of people tend to respond to the thrombopoietin analogs, TPO analogs, l thrombopag romiplostim. But you'll find some people respond poorly to a single agent. So some people won't respond to steroids or IVIG or, or these drugs. And you sometimes need to combine drugs, so immunosuppression, so typically steroids, drugs like danazole, azathioprine, with these drugs to get maximal effect. And the really good thing is often if you use a combination of drugs, you can use a fairly low dose of steroids with these drugs. So it's not the big dose that you often need when you use steroids by themselves. So why do we treat ITP? It's of course because it is a chronic disease and it has potentially serious consequences. So uh, the, the main hallmark of ITP obviously is bleeding and bruising. So you get these uh, big bruises, so the medical term for that, ecchymosis, and little dots on the skin, and the medical term for that's patiki. So here we have the skin of someone with really severe thrombocytopenia. So you do tend to find these things called patiki on the legs more than anywhere else because they're lower down, so the sort of venous pressure in the legs is higher than it is in the upper body. You can find these things called wet purpura, which are um, sort of bruises under the lining of the mouth. That's sometimes thought to be a sign of sort of higher bleeding risk um, in children. Um, you get gum bleeding. I mean, you can get gum bleeding without ITP. Some people get, have uh, gingivitis, but certainly in ITP, gum bleeding is fairly common. Uh, you can get spontaneous black eyes, things like that. And of course, the thing that we worry about is serious internal bleeding that you know, potentially cause death. So this is a bleed in the brain. So I guess that's the thing we're most worried about. When does ITP need treatment then? So really the most important consideration, I mean, I think the problem is we love things that we can measure and grab hold of and get a firm number. We love looking at platelet counts, but really the primary reason we treat ITP and what we should look at mainly is the bleeding picture. So I've had patients who've had platelet, I've had one patient who had three pregnancies, three normal deliveries. Her platelet count it was never higher than three for the 10 years I looked after her. And she was someone who despite that platelet count that, that, that sent me, I was a bit worried, but the obstetrician, <laughs> the obstetrician was, you know, obstetricians are incredibly worried about low platelet counts. I think because they're associated with some pretty bad pregnancy related complications called preeclampsia, eclampsia, fatty liver of pregnancy, a whole load of things can cause low platelets. So they get really worried about low platelets. Anyway, so, so the really important thing is bleeding picture because some people with ITP, despite a really low platelet count, you know, you, you, you know they've got a low platelet count because the blood count tells you, but you never see a bruise on them. You never see any of those patiki. On the other hand, you can see other people with a platelet count 30, you know, um, and they're covered in bruises. So that really, that, you know, that is important, and it's more important than the platelet count. But the platelet count's easy. Uh, it's something we can all uh, relate to. So in practice, we use the platelet count quite a lot. Age is an important consideration, and I'll, I'll show you some information on that, that in a moment. And other risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, smoker, vascular disease, things, these things can also uh, increase the risk of bleeding. So they might be other things why you might be more inclined to treat someone with ITP than just leave them alone and sort of see how they go. So I mentioned before the platelet count and bleeding. So this is, this is a graph that shows, uh, so this is no bleeding, this is really life-threatening bleeding. And as the platelet count gets lower and lower, the risk of life-threatening bleeding goes up considerably. So really, a platelet count of around less than 30 is where this graph really kicks up to uh, serious, the risk of serious bleeding going up. So we do tend to look at treating people with a platelet count below 30. We tend to be quite relaxed when it's higher than 30, and particularly higher than 50, because there's really not much in the way of life-threatening or serious um, bleeding seen with a platelet count of above 50. I mentioned before age is another important consideration, and this shows the risk of fatal bleed in blue and major bleeds in red as people get older. So in under 40s, the risk, and this is over a five-year period in patients with severe thrombocytopenia less than 30. So the risk of, of fatal bleeding if you're under 40 with platelet counts under 30 is, is very low, around 2% over a five-year period. Whereas as you get older, up to, up to over 60, you know, the risk is around 50% um, 
based on this data. So clearly, you know, when you're, you, what you're looking to do is preventing this sort of thing happening. So age is an important consideration when you treat ITP. So back in the old days, um, I, I have no idea why I used to be interested in ITP, because it was such a dismal condition to be <laughs> interested in because of the treatments. So long-term study of 152 patients. This is uh, at Leiden Medical Center in Holland uh, with ITP. They followed up these patients for around 10 and a half years. And what they found is if the patients had a platelet count of greater than 30 and they required no treatment to keep the platelet count above, above 30, then really they had equal long-term mortality, which is risk of death, to the general population. So as you know, the normal platelet count is 150 to 400. So this is, a, you know, you can have a platelet count seriously lower than normal, but the risk of dying from that low platelet count is, is not very high. However, if your platelet count was over 30, but you needed treatment to maintain the platelet count above 30, then you certainly did have um, a mildly increased risk of dying, but mainly a higher risk of having to be admitted to hospital for sort of complications. On the other hand, if your platelet count was less than 30 and you required treatment, so if you had severe thrombocytopenia, then the risk of death was 4.2 times the general population. And in those days, the, the, um, as I was saying earlier, the main form of treatment was what's called immunosuppression, so steroids, uh, uh, removing the spleen, azathioprine, and so on. So in fact, the risk of death was roughly equally spread between bleeding, but also infections due to the immunosuppression. Initial treatment of ITP, I'm sure everyone here with ITP knows what their initial treatment was, and it was in its steroids. So there are a few different steroids we can use. I'm not going to go into really much depth uh, about treatments because we're going to hear about that a bit later on. But broadly speaking, there are three steroid treatments that are fairly commonly used. So the most commonly used is prednisolone, which is a tablet, uh, usually given around one milligram per kilogram of weight. Um, so typically, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams a day in an adult. Um, and I guess in the past, we've sort of had this idea that you've got to be on it for several months and a slow taper. That, I'd have to say that that sort of thinking is changing now, and we're tending to uh, favor getting patients off steroids a lot more quickly, mainly to avoid the long side, of, the side effects. Also, because there's probably not a lot of benefit in terms of long-term chance of going to remission for a longer course and because there are better alternatives uh, if you need long-term treatment. Methylprednisolone is still something, it's a sort of intravenous version of prednisolone if you like, tends to be given at a much higher dose. It's really given if you really want to get the platelet count moving up quickly. So if someone comes in with severely low platelets and they're bleeding, this is something you might use. It generally tends to be given very short term you know, we usually, we would usually use around 1,000 milligrams a day for three days, something like that. So it's a big dose, but short burst. And then dexamethasone. We all got terribly excited about dexamethasone a few years ago when some studies in Italy showed that the long-term rate of response to steroids um, was better if you used dexamethasone uh, given at, uh, what we call pulses, so four-day bursts over, over periods uh, of intervals of two to four weeks um, for four to six months. But it must be said, I guess the initial excitement is somewhat tempered with more general experience where, you know, uh, we didn't really find uh, this to be too much more uh, successful in the long term than prednisolone. So the interesting thing about, you know, they're both steroids, they do have, so they do have different side effect profiles mainly because of the way they're given. So short, sharp bursts can certainly cause, you know, um, quite significant um, sort of mental effects more than anything um, and you know really you know you get very high dose but short term this is more of a sort of a diabetes um, uh, osteoporosis uh, cushingoid features which means you get the brown face put on weight and so on so the, the side effect profiles are a bit different not because of the drugs primarily but because of the the way you use them one of the things that always, again, as I said, I really love undiagnosing ITP, but one of the things as an ITP sort of person is, I'm always disappointed with is when you see people and they've just been on steroids for such a long time. And um, we don't really have much, you know, really good evidence for how long people should be on steroids, but this was a sort of a, 
Um, this was a, uh, a survey done in 1996 of some ITP experts who were asked, look, if you're treating someone with steroids and they're not responding or if they're only partially responding, how long would you keep them on that treatment for, uh, that high dose treatment? And really, no one was suggesting that you'd keep going much for more than four weeks. But you do find patients, you know, get referred who've been on high dose steroids for very much longer than that sometimes. Intravenous immunoglobulin, uh, in Australia, that we've got Intragam, which is made locally, Flebogamma and Privagen uh, are the options. There are a few different recipes used. We tend to use uh, this dose of 0.4 grams a day, for one to five days. Um, there are different doses used in other parts of the world. Generally get a pretty good response to intravenous immunoglobulin um, quite quickly, but it's a very transient response. Often you lose response over um, two to four weeks. Uh, you can get reactions to intravenous immunoglobulin. You can get headaches, particularly if you give it quickly or you give one of the more concentrated uh, versions. But I guess where the main role of intravenous immunoglobulin is, if you've got someone going along with a platelet count sort of 30 to 50, absolutely fine, but if they then need an operation, um, the surgeon more than the haematologist will want the platelet count to be higher. Uh, so you tend to give this as a short-term treatment to boost the platelet count and keep it up over the surgical period and for a couple of weeks afterwers. So splenectomy is still used, unfortunately probably more in Australia than, it, than in other parts of the world because of the restrictions we have on accessing the newer drugs uh, requiring a splenectomy or medical, um, what's called contraindication to splenectomy, I'll mention that. So uh, Paul uh, Kaz Nelson was a medical student in Prague in 1916 when he convinced the professor of surgery, Professor Schlurfer, to remove the spleen of a patient with severe thrombocytopenia. So Professor Schlurfer did this and the platelet count of the patient went up from two to 500. So that's pretty impressive. I must say I find it a little difficult to accept that in 2019 a medical student could convince a professor of surgery to do anything. And, and, I, and I suppose it's a credit to um, Kaz Nelson and to Schlofer uh, that, that this happened. And really then splenectomy became really the go-to treatment for ITP right up until the 1950s until um, our steroids were first used. So splenectomy really, you know, people don't like splenectomies. Uh, I don't like sending people for splenectomy. People don't like having splenectomies, but strictly speaking, it is still the highest chance of cure. There's around an 80% initial response rate, and, um, and around 60% of patients will respond long term. But certainly, there are patients we send to splenectomy who go through all that and in the end need more treatment. So, waste of time. There are some scans that can be done. Unfortunately, we don't have ready access to those scans unless you live in Geelong. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, there are some things that are said to be predictive of response to splenectomy, but I must say I've never found them to be terribly useful. So thrombopoietin receptor agonists, so uh, we have romiplostim and l trombopag available in Australia. So they can only be used if ITP still needs treatment after a failed splenectomy or a splenectomy cannot be performed due to medical reasons. And someone saying, no, I don't want a splenectomy is not, required, is not regarded as a contraindication. So I must say, uh, PBS is a lot easier to get by than they used to be when we first had access to these drugs. You had to, in those days, we had to get a letter from a surgeon saying that the patient wasn't fit for splenectomy. Now, a letter from the haematologist. So if you're a bit old, got a bit of high blood pressure, got a bit of this, bit of that, I must say I've always found that, that PBS will now approve these drugs. But, you know, if you're 30 and you've really got no other illness, it's, it's a really hard task to try and get these drugs without a splenectomy, unfortunately. So romiplostim uh, was the first, I think Australia was the first country in the world which romiplostim was approved and rebated by the government. So it's an injection that's given weekly under the skin. It works in about 80% of people. Um, sometimes when it doesn't work, just adding a low dose of steroid, even as low as prednisolone, two and a half milligrams a day, will considerably boost the effect and it will mean someone who's said not to respond will in fact respond. Um, 
Many side effects that are listed, if you look at the product information, a lot of side, I think most of those probably relate to the early studies when nearly everyone who went on the studies had been on steroid, was coming off steroid. And as you, you know, many people in the room might know, when you come off steroid, if you've been on them for a while, you know, you can get some quite significant side effects, aches and pains, feeling lousy. Um, so you probably do get some aches and pains with these drugs. You probably do get a bit of headache, but, but certainly the longer we've used them, the, the more, I guess, optimistic we feel about there being really no, not much in the way of long-term complications. So the long-term safety appears to be excellent. There appears to be no increased cancer risk associated with using these drugs. Uh, the risk of blood clots is probably due to ITP itself causing clots rather than the drugs we used to think. Well, now we're sort of thinking maybe the risk is, is a bit higher in people who are on these drugs, but certainly I think the benefit of these drugs certainly overweighs the drawbacks. Uh, l trombopag is the tablet version um, of TPO taken daily. Very important to follow instructions on taking the tablet in relation to meal times, taking supplements. And I've got a load of stories I won't lay out in front of you now, but so many people <coughs> often start off well because they, you know, they, they, they're told exactly what to do. But then over a period of a couple of years, I guess, relax on those dietary things. And often you see the drug becomes less effective. Things like, you know, people quite innocently take uh, things like iron supplements, zinc supplements. Think, hey, I'll go to the chemist, get some of these things I can buy, make myself feel better. And those things can absolutely um, interfere with the absorption of l trombopag So it's really important. There is a newer drug, which is a sort of, it's almost like a second generation l trombopag called Avatrombopag that's been licensed in uh, North America, in, in uh, the US, that hopefully will be licensed in, in Australia soon, that has no dietary issues. So really, I suspect will knock l trombopag out of the park in terms of a, uh, a sort of treatment option. Again, I think the side of, most of the side effects of l trombopag probably relate to the early studies when people came off steroids and started this drug. Again, long-term safety risk, excellent, no increased cancer risk, and again, you know, possibly a little higher rate of blood clots, but certainly I think the benefits outweigh the risks. Mabthera or rituximab is the antibody treatment that we prim primarily used to use in lymphomas, but it's increasingly used in autoimmune diseases. It's given through an IV drip every week for four weeks. It's not paid for by the federal government PBS, so it has to be paid for by the patient, their insurance company, or the hospital that's looking after them. The important thing is sometimes you're told, hey, this is far too expensive. The important thing to know is that ITP can be treated with a much lower dose than patients with blood cancers need. So it really does reduce the cost a lot to, if people just think they can only use the lymphoma dose. Around about 60% of people initially respond to treatment, around 30% of people have long-term response to um, rituximab. In my experience, the most, and um, well, in, I guess in general experience, the most likely people to benefit are patients with secondary ITPs where there are associated other autoimmune diseases. Um, so younger women with other autoimmune diseases are the ones that, you know, really you can pick to, who may respond to um, rituximab long-term. Interestingly, uh, there's been a few trials looking at rituximab and ITP, and actually using rituximab in initial treatment to our, uh, in ITP really didn't seem to have any benefit. Um, one of my favorite drugs uh, fortunately came down in price a few years ago and made it much more readily available is mycophenolate. Um, really, its use is based on specialist experience and not really too many trials uh, really proving it's useful. It was mainly used in uh, uh, transplants, kidney, liver transplants um, when it uh, came out initially. Twice daily tablet um, certainly allows a lower dose of steroid to be used. Um, may have a long-term benefit in some people and if you've been on this drug for, you know, for a few months to a year or so, it may be increases the rate of requiring no ongoing treatment and certainly less side effects than its alternative which is called azathioprine. Uh, Dapsone is a, co is a drug that's commonly used in less developed countries and also in the less developed capital of Australia, Canberra, I found out last mm. night. <laughs> <laughs> I must say I've never used Dapsone but it's, it's worth a mention. There was a big study done in Brazil um, uh, that was published uh, I think last year that really showed it can be quite a useful drug. Once daily tablet works in about 50% of people after three weeks. Uh, it causes red cell breakdown or hemolysis. Um, so that can be, you know, it, you've got to check that people don't have a 
specific problem with their red cells that can really make this a severe problem um, before you start called G6PD deficiency. Um, it, if you do respond and you stop the drug, you tend to find rapid relapse. Um, as I say, not commonly used in Australia, but certainly, um, you know, some, some, obviously some, some of my colleagues do favour this drug. There's a drug called Danazole. This is an anabolic steroid. Uh, it has less virilizing effects um, than some other anabolic steroids, the sort of things that you hear about who, in people who go to gyms. It, it, it works in this condition called aplastic anemia, where the bone marrow is too thin and has been used in ITP. When I say decreased virilizing effects, I've never, I have, tr for some reason, I tried it in a couple of women once, and let me tell you, they did not appreciate uh, that uh, treatment strategy. <laughs> So it, you will grow hairs on your chin, your, your voice will deepen, you'll get more muscles. If you want that, this is the drug for you. <laughs> Daily tablet, uh, response rates up to 50%. There are risks, if you have it long term, of, of some liver tumours, and I say it is virilising. So it's not something we often use. Virilizing means it sort of makes you uh, virile. Like a ma so if you're a woman, hairs on your chin, deeper Thank voice, you. more muscles. And if you're a man, similarly, you know, it, virilizing means kind of transforms you into a man. Mm. <laughs> those things, if you stop treatment, those things do revert. Yeah. But, but certainly, um, certainly, uh, yeah, not, not something that most ladies appreciate. <laughs> Azathioprine, again, it used to be a drug I used a fair bit. I, it's not my cofenolate, I must say, knocked it off my list to, to, to a large degree. A daily tablet. Some people do have a genetic condition that um, results in azathioprine being much more toxic than usual. And certainly, um, if, uh, if people are started on azathioprine, they should have this test to make sure it's not going to be a problem. And again, uh, it, can, it can allow a lower dose of steroids to be used over time. H. pylori eradication. So H. pylori is a bug that's found in the stomach. It's the bug that's linked to stomach ulcers. It was discovered, uh, the link was discovered by some gastroenterologists, in fact, from Western Australia, and they received the Nobel Prize for their discovery. And it really transformed the way stomach ulcers are treated. Um, so H. pylori, this bug is treated with antibiotics. So combination antibiotics are a relatively short course of treatment over one to two weeks. It has been found in Japanese patients. Um, there's a relatively high rate of H. pylori in Japanese patients with ITP, and if you treat them, then a lot of them are cured. Exper my experience with H. pylori, and I know um, experience in North America too, has been far more disappointing. In fact, I have never treated a patient. Um, so I did, uh, when this data first came out, I tested everyone for H. pylori and treated everyone came back positive, no one um, uh, responded. Now, I, you know, if, if people are requiring recurrent treatment, I do sometimes still treat it. And uh, I must say, I've never found H. pylori eradication to be useful in, in our population. If I had a patient of Japanese ethnicity, I guess I would still do this. Um, but certainly, it's, it's really been very disappointing. Uh, one thing I just wanted to touch upon, this is some long-term data from David's um, patient group in Boston and my patient group in Brisbane looking at patients who'd been on romiplostim for more than six months. So what we were looking at is people, so these, a lot of these people had had ITV for many years, uh, had lots of prior treatments and then were treated with romiplostim for six months. And what we found is that these patients who you might expect would need lifelong treatment, in fact a good proportion of them, around 30% of the patients who were treated with romiplostim for more than six months, came off, were able to come off treatment. Um, and be functionally cured, so that that doesn't necessarily mean a normal platelet count, but it means they had a completely safe platelet count with no need for ongoing treatment. So, you know, a lot of the what we call chronic ITP does not necessarily need chronic treatment, and there are some treatments of ITP, so l romiplostim, mycophenolate, that a course of treatment over a period of time may in fact fix the disease to a level where the platelet count no longer needs treatment. So that, that's uh, the end, so just a brief summary then. So ITP is an autoimmune disorder. There's no simple diagnostic test. In most adults, it's a long-term disease. I haven't touched on kids because that's going to be this afternoon, but it isn't necessarily in kids. There are now really quite effective treatments for most people with ITP. Some patients will not need long-term treatment. They'll have a course of treatment and then we'll be able to come off treatment. And it's important 
that, that that's understood by treating doctors. So if you've got ITP, you've been on treatment with a totally normal platelet count for months and years, you know, just raise the question with your doctor, do you think I need to stay on this treatment? Because you may be able to get off it and your platelet count may stay up. There is a risk of steroid exposure, and I think this is one of the real problems with ITPs. I think a lot more steroid is used than really uh, should be used now that we have good alternatives. Um, and again, I think that's a matter of, gr uh, of growing understanding of ITP amongst treating doctors. And there are new, this is not a summary because I haven't mentioned this before, but there are new treatment trials um, going on most of the time in specialist centres around Australia where we're looking at new drugs. Uh, newer drugs in ITP, um, you know, are, they're not exactly coming out all the time, but certainly, um, s you know, centres with an interest in ITP will regularly be looking at new drugs. So for patients who really are in a tight spot, um, there may be an alternative new treatment that could be um, a, a fix for their condition. So certainly I've got a new trial. David's the um, a worldwide um, lead investigator for this trial using, a, using a, a medication called a BTK inhibitor in ITP that really looks very promising in terms of its uh, effectiveness, excellent side effect profile. And, it, and if patients go on this study, and respond, in fact, there's, uh, there's, there's a chance now to stay on the treatment um, for as long as needed. So that's looking like a good study. So, so there are uh, centres around Australia which, uh, which, which are conducting these studies. Um, and uh, I think you're going to put something about that on the ITP website. About, yeah. 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 And Dr. Choi was talking about clinical trials this afternoon as well. So, <coughs> wonderful. Okay, well, thanks very much. Have I gone over time?